Thank you for joining the Judaism Demystified podcast, Professor Schiffman. It's an honor and pleasure to have you on. Thank you. So for our viewers who may be unfamiliar, can you provide us with an overview of what the Dead Sea Scrolls are, the historical context it was written in, and how their discovery in the mid-20th century transformed our understanding of Jewish history and Second Temple Judaism? Okay, of course, the question itself could be a 45-minute lecture, but we'll try to get it down into a, uh, a shorter answer for this evening. So what we have to understand is that in the caves at an area called Qumran, and that is not the ancient name, that's a, an Arab name for the area, on the shore of the Dead Sea, beginning in 1947 and running through the 19, mid-50s, approximately 900, I shouldn't say manuscripts, but we should say better, the remnants of what were 900 manuscripts from the Second Temple period were found. Specifically, these documents were copied between 225 BCE and around the turn of the era. We sometimes say the year zero. There is no year zero, right? But okay, the turn of the era. Now, these documents were collected in a library of some people who had a group of buildings on the shore of the Dead Sea. And these individuals represent a sect of Judaism from Second Temple times. Now, most scholars think that they are the Essenes who are described by Josephus, although what that word means, but there are many similarities between Josephus' description and what we see with the uh, scrolls themselves. Now, these documents, as I mentioned, are very fragmentary. And after they were discovered, they had to be reassembled into a kind of partial jigsaw puzzle. Now, I have to say that this is not the case with the first seven scrolls that were found by the famous Bedouin boy who first wandered into what we call Cave One in 1947 because those scrolls were closer to being complete. And in fact, in the case of what we call the Great Isaiah Scroll, it's the entire book of Yeshayahu, of Isaiah, from beginning to end. So those texts were in much better shape. But then all those discovered afterwards, which are about 900, are in this fragmentary form. Now, we generally believe that these scrolls were gathered by the sectarian group but not that all of them were composed by them, because there are three types of literature in the collection. The first is all books of Tanakh, except for Esther. Now, that isn't exactly true, because Ezra and Nehemiah were considered one book. There is no Nehemiah. So you could say, except Esther and Nehemiah. But also, that's group one. Group two are texts that were generally read by Jews in the Second Temple period, they're what the rabbis in the Talmud call Sparim Kitsoniim, external books. That group included some works we knew before, but not in the original Hebrew or Aramaic, and some works that we did know partially in Hebrew or in Aramaic, and some other works that we never heard of before. And uh, that's the second group of texts. The third group of texts are documents pertaining to a sectarian group the one that gathered the library, and they are replete with the particular views of the group on all kinds of subjects regarding Second Temple Judaism. Now, I want to say as a summary comment that we have to be very careful in making the false assumption that all you learn about when you study these texts are some strange Jews that went to the Dead Sea area because they didn't want to live with their fellow Jews, whether in Yerushalayim or some other place, we have to avoid that. Because since the first part of it is Bible, the second part of it is material that Jews are reading all over, the, are reading all over there's so much we can learn about Second Temple Judaism in general, about virtually every topic. And even from the sectarian documents, they will, for example, criticize others for what they're doing. So we learn all kinds of things about Second Temple Judaism from these texts. Now, I should say a word about what the scrolls are not before, so to speak, concluding the answer to this rather wide question, and that is they're not Christian. They don't mention any Christian figures. 
they're pre-Christian. They may be, they are of value in understanding the background of Christianity because that's in Second Temple Judaism. They're also not medieval, a claim that was once made for the medieval Karaites. And the final false claim, they are not the library of Jerusalem or the Jerusalem temple, some kind of official Jewish library. They are gathered by a sectarian group. Fascinating. And um, I'm just curious to know what got you interested in this topic. And did that ever affect your religious beliefs or obs observance? Well, to start with the question of what got me interested, it's funny. I was looking for a topic. I was studying with a very famous Bible scholar at Brandeis University. And as an undergraduate, I was looking for a topic for an honors thesis. And he was an expert on Tehillim, Professor Nachum Sarna. And he suggested to me the possibility of comparing some of the poetry and the scrolls to Sefer Tehillim, the Book of Psalms. And that was my first research on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then it, I somehow or another, after taking a few courses in graduate school, seemed to my, find myself most interested in this stuff because you were reading texts and analyzing texts that no one was working on. But then there was one extra feature. I realized very early that there was a lack of, we should say, background on the part of many of the scholars studying this stuff in terms of understanding the texts of early Judaism that we already had, the rabbinic texts were the most of the material, Mishnah, Talmud, etc. And so I, because I knew that material, or at least knew how to study that material, you can really never know all of that material unless you're you know, the building own or Rav Avadi Yosef or somebody with that kind of, of, of way of seeing it all at once, but, but, but knew how to study it, that I could make a very particular contribution to the field that would be helpful. And uh, I never was sure at the beginning that it would become such a big area of interest. And so then you started to have market forces operating, people constantly asking me to do things like what we're doing right now. And so I have done a lot of other research. I'll tell you, I actually just recently sent to press a volume in which I collected together over 40 articles, scholarly articles that I wrote on non-Dead Sea Scroll topics. And I've written books that are not Dead Sea Scroll topics. I, I don't think too many people know about that. You get a certain reputation. As far as, I would not say it affected religious observance. Where it really affects you in a certain way, and especially when you are so close to this, the actual material as opposed to the discussion, is you really see the continuities of Judaism physically in front of you. When you, for example, see the excavated uh, mikvaot, or you looking at the ritual baths, or you're looking at tefillin from that period, or actual manuscripts of Tanakh from that period, you realize the continuity of everything that we're doing. So I think that that's a very big area in which it, it affects you. So I think that's a fair answer to that question. Fantastic. Okay. Um, and second, and another question is, among the diverse texts found within the Dead Sea Scrolls, which do you find most compelling or significant for understanding the religious and social dynamics of the Jewish community of the Quran? Yeah, this is a kind of uh, funny question, because there's a tendency we all have to answer by the material that we work on. Now, I uh, published a couple of years ago after working for 20 years on it with a former student and now colleague, Professor Andrew Gross of Catholic University of America in, in Washington, D.C., a whole new edition of the Temple Scroll. Now, I've been in love with the Temple Scroll since the day it came out. That's actually, let me see, the, uh, the third book that I published on this scroll. And so I would certainly want to say that this is a very important text, but you can't fall into that trap of thinking whatever you work on is the most important. The truth is that every time I turn to another text and begin to work at it in, in depth, I see that there's tremendous amount of really interesting stuff in virtually every one of these texts. But um, I, as I say, in a certain sense, the Temple Scrolls attracted me the most. There's a reason for that, because in 1967, when I was still a student, I had the great opportunity of meeting Yiga El Yadin because he came to Brandeis to lecture on the scroll they had recovered during the 67 war. What happened was that in, in 1960, 
someone came to uh, to uh, Yadin and offered to sell him this scroll and gave him a few fragments as a sample. Yadin gave the guy a $10,000 deposit. The guy disappeared, never came back. So at any rate, the, when 1967 war came, Yadin by that time realized where the scroll was. It's possible that he was also tipped off by Professor Frank Cross of Harvard because Frank Cross was taken, you think there's no excitement in this field, was taken to some type of a dark area under a bridge in Beirut. And uh, this fellow named, we call Kondo, Halil Iskandar, who during the days when Qumran was under Jordanian control from 48 to 67, he served as the one who bought texts from the Bedouin and then sold them to the Palestine Archaeological Museum in East Jerusalem, now the Rockefeller. So anyhow, Cross was taken under some bridge somewhere in Beirut and hustled into a car and a guy under a blanket Try to sell him a text. And he said to the guy under the blanket, Kondo, get out from under that silly blanket. And Kondo then offered to sell him the manuscript in 19. This, this took place in, approximately in May of 67. So he may have tipped off, Ross may have tipped off Yadin when the war started. And Yadin arranged, as a result of this, for Israeli security agents to go to the home of Kondo in Bethlehem and to get the scroll. They eventually paid him. Now, Yadin came to Brandeis to lecture about this scroll. I mean, this was some exciting story. And I was asked to accompany him back to Providence in the car. And we were really in luck because Yadin didn't know how to get to his house. He was a visiting professor and his daughter drove. They didn't let him drive because in the army, he was the commander of the 48th War of the entire Israeli armed forces. And he couldn't drive. He kept on cracking up army cars. So he never drove thereafter, and he didn't know how to get to his house. Remember, there was a time before, not only before your phone, but before GPS, right? No ways, nothing, right? He didn't know how to go. So we drove around for two hours, and I got to meet Yigal Yadin. So this really excited me, this scroll. I thought maybe I'd do it for my dissertation. But he dragged on publishing it, and it didn't come out until the early 70s. So I didn't do my dissertation on it. I did my dissertation on other halachic texts, texts of Jewish law from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the minute this text was available, I started working on it. And uh, interestingly, some of the things that I still write are about that text, even though the the new edition is out. So it, it never, it never, somehow that text never stops interesting me. And one of the things that that text sort of gave birth to indirectly in my work is that there's another text which came to light only at a conference in 1984 in Yerushalayim. And that text is the one we call MMT, abbreviated, Mitzat Maseya Torah, some decisions or laws of the Torah, because a Maaseh in the Talmud Yerushalmi means a halachic decision. So at any rate, this text, is a, set, is, a, is a group of 22 laws in the form of a letter from the founders of the Dead Sea Scrolls sect to the Jerusalem high priests, telling them why they seceded and why they are not going to agree with them as to 22 laws. And these laws are all about sacrifices and tuma vatara, purity and impurity. And when you examine them, you find out that they take the view that in the Mishnah, is that of the Tzdukim, the Sadducees. Remember, the Sadducees were the sect of high priests in Second Temple times and uh, some of the arist aristocracy that competed with the Pharisees, the Prushim, were the forerunners of the Talmudic rabbis. So I jumped into working on this text also like crazy. It's another one of my favorites and ended up publishing quite a bit. But what's really interesting is that this text agreed a lot with this other one, the Temple Scroll, called the Hebrew Megillah HaMikdash. And together, we're able to put together a tremendous amount of material pertaining to the halachic Jewish law views of the Sadducees. And that is an amazing discovery for Second Temple Judaism in general. Maybe I'm talking about some characters who assembled some manuscripts at the Dead Sea. So that's what I said. We don't want to study the characters. We want to study Second Temple Judaism. And these guys have been a great help 
and learning about it. What do we know about the Sadducees? What do we know about their beliefs, their ideas, their activities? Well, we didn't know too much because Josephus talks a little about it and, and the Gomorrah has some. So first of all, on the what Josephus tells us, he tells us, you see, we have to understand something. There's a problem here before we even go on. A lot of Sadducees were very Hellenized, but other Sadducees were really pious Kohanim. And so it seems that some pious Kohanim founded the Dead Sea Scroll sect after the Maccabean Revolt. Now, therefore, we have to differentiate between them and the ones that were Hellenized. Josephus talks a lot about the Hellenized. He talks about how they believe basically the Epicurean idea that God isn't involved in the world once he created it. They He talks about the fact that they basically take literalist interpretations of the Torah, apparently more literalist. He says they don't believe in a world to come. Now, when we take a look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and we compare them to some of the material in rabbinic literature, we start to understand a little bit more about the pious Sadducees were very strict on laws of purity and impurity, who disagreed with the practices of the Prushim, the Pharisees, about some minor, what looked like minor elements of how to do the ritual, but they even disagree on some more important questions on how to do the ritual in the Beit HaMikdash, in the temple. So at any rate, we start to understand that we don't know that much from Josephus. We know some halachic opinions in rabbinic literature. Just for example, in rabbinic literature, we know that they observed Shavuot on Sunday. Only on Sunday because they began to count the Omer Mimocharat Shabbat for the day after the Sabbath, which was understood by them to mean Shabbat Shabbat. Whereas the Prushim, and this is the counting of the Omer by all Jews who count the Omer, counted the Omer from the day after the first day of Pesach, which they understood to be the, quote, Shabbat, meaning like a festival. At any rate, when we go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, and this is in the Temple Scroll, and it's in this MMT text, and it's in about 25 other texts, we have calendar texts that give their calendar. And believe it or not, how do you have Shabbat always on a Sunday? You have a calendar which uses solar months. And if you have a calendar of 364 days, and I know this is hard to follow quickly, and you have days of 30, 30, 31, 30, 30, 30, 31, and you have four of them, a calendar of 364, 91 times four, you end up with a situation in which you can have Shabbat, have, uh, have uh, Shavuot come out every single year on a, uh, on a Sunday. But by the way, they start the counting of the Omer not on the first Saturday night of Cholamoid Pesach. They started on the first Saturday night after the last day of Pesach. And it looks, from looking at this, that this sectarian calendar was a Second Temple competing calendar, which uh, the Sadducees held to. So this is how we start to learn more and more about the Sadducees by looking at some of the Jewish law type and practices of the Dead Sea Scroll set. But there are some people who mistakenly think that, oh, if that's the case, they must be the Sadducees. No. What emerges is there were two trends of halakha, of Jewish law in Second Temple times. The one of the Pharisees, the one of the Sadducees. The Pharisees is the one that the rabbis follow, the one we follow. The Sadducees went out of use eventually, but I can tell you, it was followed by the Dead Sea sectarians as well. It was followed by the medieval Karaites. And uh, until to, to this day, there are Karaites and they follow certain of these laws. And it's followed, was followed and, and some level is by the Samaritans, who are the Kutim known from the Gemara and who still exist until today. Samaritans, there are two major communities of Samaritans, uh, one, one uh, near Hargrizim, in Shem and the other one uh, in Cholom till today in Israel. I'm just curious to know why people, let's say, equate, um, they kind of consider the Karaites to be the spiritual heirs of the Sadducees. When I, I see the Sadducees, as, as as you mentioned, they're literalists, and Karaites seem to be metaphoric about certain... Yeah, you see, this is one of the things we learned from the scrolls, because if it's true that the Sadducee method is shared by the scrolls, 
when you look at the way the scrolls interpret the Tanakh, you see, especially the Torah, that it's closer to literal, but not really literal. And I'm going to give you a kind of lahav deal comparison. So people say that evangelical Christians are fundamentalists, which means that they interpret the Bible literally. Do you think there's any fundament, any evangelical who thinks God has an arm? So what do we mean they interpret the Bible literally? It's an overstatement what's made by about evangelicals. It's an overstatement made about this, about about the 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 uh, Sadducees. But the reason why Sadducees and Karaites are considered to perhaps have some continuity comes from several things. Number one, there are some Dead Sea Scrolls texts, especially the one originally called Fragments of a Tzadokite Work, now known as the Damascus Document, that somehow found its way in two manuscripts into the Cairo Geniza. And the only way to explain that is if somebody was reading this text. The Karaites seem to be a logical group for it. The second reason is that the Karaites themselves make the claim that they go back to the Sadducees and have many things that are parallel to either Sadducee halacha or Dead Sea Scrolls halacha. So one of the possibilities is that certain of these practices survived underground. They weren't observable. But in the end, they came out of ground when the Karaite movement began to coalesce. And the history of the Karaite movement itself is very complicated. But when it began to coalesce, that it absorbed some of these traditions that had been underground that you don't see in rabbinic literature, but that existed among some groups of Jews. And the other possibility that's been suggested is that there are some claims of discovery of scrolls in ancient times and early medieval times that maybe some documents that had been hidden somewhere from Ron or elsewhere may have found their way to some of these groups. But when you also take the fact that the Samaritans are in this thing too, it does look like the Samaritans and the Sadducees, they do share a lot of things which are found also in the scrolls, a lot of ideas of specific halachot. Let me ask you, when you look at um, the Pharisees back then, what do you glean when, in regards to tradition? How do you understand, based on all the research that you've been doing on it, what, how, how would you understand rabbinic tradition? Well, you see, the thing is like this. What happens when you study the whole Second Temple period, and in fact, the history of rabbinic material as a historical set of, of documents, you come to realize that the story is more complex than the way it's usually told. Let me put it that way. And one very good example is this. We learn from the sectarian material that in Second Temple times, when the beginnings of the Mishnah are taking place, there was a competing group about whom we knew only some nasty remarks about them, or why they were wrong. Now we start to understand, not just by the Dead Sea Scrolls sect itself, but some of the material in the scrolls, we start to have a much wider understanding of the intellectual religious ferment that was going on in Second Temple times. And we therefore start to realize that there wasn't just one group and a couple of schleppers that were being excommunicated, but that there really was a competition in this, in this period. And then if you go back and you reread even many rabbinic texts, you'll realize that this is, it, it, we just, we didn't understand that, but it, it's it's clear from the text that that was the case. So that's a big difference between, let's call it the simplistic way of seeing the tradition as if it's the only way and assuming that it just continuously goes with no competition to realizing that there was competition, which essentially was, you could say, defeated by what we consider to be the authoritative tradition but the other views did exist. And you start to understand much more what was going on in the period, as I say, from an intellectual and religious point of view. <laughs> now, I think it would be difficult to maintain an academic approach as an Orthodox Jew if you didn't believe that the approach that won was the right one. And that's a very important point. And, and what, what things have you seen that supports that for you? You mean that they're the right one? Yeah. Okay. 
So first of all, in many of these arguments that are going back and forth, you can see sometimes that the evidence of the Tanakh is in favor of the rabbinic view. Now, this will get into some very small technicalities about some of these things that are being discussed, but you sometimes can tell that that's the case. But then there's another thing. If you step back and think about it, why is it the why is it that the point of view of the Prushim and the rabbis survived and the other point of view did not? So part of that answer is in the inability to use the combination of interpretation and the notion of Torah Shabbat Peh to allow Judaism to deal with all the ongoing challenges that it faced in different times and places. And if you take a look, for example, at the history of Karaism, you see that sometimes they had no choice but to simply back down from major positions because their system does not allow them to deal with these things. And part of the greatness of the system that emerges from the Gemara and then from as it goes on through the years until today is the ability to deal with these situations and to know how to handle uh, a whole variety of things that come up that no one ever could have imagined in those days. So when I say it, it looks like it's correct both from an interpretive point of view and also from the fact that it's a successful way for Judaism to develop over the ages and to maintain itself in ways that could not have been done with uh, the other systems, as you see when you watch what that system did in terms of the Samaritans and the, and the Karaites. Right. Interestingly, the, the Rambam, um, in his in his understanding of Torah Shabbat, to my limited understanding, um, interestingly, uh, he he sees the adaptability of Torah Shabbat as central right. to its core. Right. This is stated more clearly by Rav Yosef Albo in the Sefer Ha'ikarim. But that's right. That is right. Now, there are some people who turn around and say, well, that proves that you, you know, you can just decide whatever you want. But no, there's this tremendous idea of a balance, kind of conservatism, along with the ability exactly. to adapt to new circumstances. And, and and there are certain, like, you could call them rules of the game of how this proceeds in a way that it maintains itself essentially, you know, in an unending way. And that is really a, an amazing fact. So to some extent, the what you could call the, the victory or the winner or whatever it is, is because the system is right. It was a system that allows Judaism to continue with its basic principles and its basic ideas in, in a permanent way while at the same time dealing with the new circumstances. And by the way, an interesting thing is, but you're not supposed to come around and say, let's change this, let's change this. That we don't do. Yeah. So this is the interesting thing, even though we know that if you look at things we are doing, they're not the same as they used to be done. And some of these are almost unimportant things. But nonetheless, you see things being different than they were. There's um, it's almost like, like you said, there's a there's like a, a balance that's that's right, that's coming through. That's right, and we maintain that balance, and we know how to maintain that balance by appealing to our textual traditions and and making use of them to assure that. Fantastic, thank you. By the way, is there um, in terms of. Uh, do we see anything in these texts or show that the show anything specific um, that shows like how uh, the rabbis did draw from existing traditions? No, because you see, we have to remember these people oppose our tradition. Now, this is the thing that's part of it is maybe almost partly humorous. I say they oppose our tradition, but they agree with it all over the place. What do I mean? This is an opposing group that leaves. Jerusalem leaves the main stay where they leave these people to separate because they believe that no one else is properly observing the Torah. Mm. And they have had affiliates in other places, but this is where their main center apparently was. So what happens is that they give us information about things that pertain to the continuity of the rabbis, but they're, con they're constantly criticizing the Pharisees. Now, while they criticize the Pharisees, 
they do a lot of the same stuff. Because one of the things that we forget very often in Judaism is that there's certain basic fundamentals that are going to say fundamental no matter what. So you get, you know, just I'll give you a funny example. So they cri they criticize the Prussian all the time. The first law of Shabbat they have is that Shabbat starts when the sun is distant from the horizon by its own diameter. And that's about 45 minutes before Shabbat. Now, how do they know that law? Because they quote the Pasuk, right? Shemur at Yom HaShabbat Lakat Shav. Now, keep the Sabbath to sanctify it. If you look up that Pasuk and see how it's treated by Chazal, you'll see, guess what? All the people who think that we're obligated in HaTorah to add time at the beginning of Shabbat that will give us a little extra of what we call Tosefa Shabbat, addition to Shabbat, they quote the same thing. Now, I, that's an example of the exact same Shabbat law. But if you'll keep going in Shabbat laws, you'll find Shabbat laws where this group is stricter. And you'll see that in, in a number of places. To put it in a funny example, you're not allowed to make a salad on Shabbat. And I'm not talking about chopping little pieces like the discussion of Israeli salad. You know, it, it all got to be done before. Not just that you have to cook before. Everything has to be prepared before. So in some cases, they're stricter. And yet, at the same time, some things are basically the same. Interesting. Okay. Benji, go to the next question. You also find that, I've heard some people theorize that, like, when when the Sadducean movement kind of collapsed, you see remnants of their or sympathetic rabbis, let's say, in the in the rabbinic tradition. Oh, that's Rabbi Elias Shamoti. There's one rabbi that is identified in the Gemara as having been Right, not a Sadducee, but a Shammaite. Right now, the better question is where do the Shammaites come in this? So, I would like to suggest that if you take a look at the whole history here, what you can see is that there is a set of you could almost call it a process of elimination. Because if you go back into the Second Temple period, and we're really talking about the period post the Maccabean Revolt which was 168 to 164 BCE. And we're really talking about the period after 152. Because in 152, that's when Yonatan, the Hasmonean, establishes the Hasmonean uh, basically rule. Because people don't realize this, but after the Maccabean Revolt, Yehuda and his followers were kicked out of the Beit HaMikdash, kicked out of Jerusalem. He was killed in battle in 160. So it's only in 152 when Yonatan is able to take control, that the period of the Hashmonaim, the Hasmonean Empire begins. Now, once you hit that period, that's where Josephus says there are three sects. And he mentions the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. Again, a lot of people think the Essenes are the Dead Sea sect. Now, basically at that point, there are two general trends in Jewish law and practice. The one that we later call Pharisaic and we call Sadducean. Now, what happens is that when you get to the destruction of the temple, the Sadducean loses its power base, the temple, and basically stops functioning. But the question is, among the Prushim, there then takes place an inner debate, Beit Hillel, Beit Shammai. Now, now Beit Shammai takes the position of the stricter ones. That is to say that even though there was a fundamental difference because the Sadducees don't really accept the idea of Torah Shabbat Peh, or a law. And that doesn't exist with the Shammaites. They do accept it. Nonetheless, the Shammaites end up arguing for stricter view than the one of the, of the Beit Hillel that wins out. Well, the Shammaites basically die out, and the view of Beit Hillel goes forward as the normative, more lenient view. So it happens twice that the system knocks out the stricter people, because the Tzedukim, in many cases, was stricter, those who were faithful to halakha, not the Hellenized ones who weren't. It knocks that out, and then still again has to knock out what you could call not really a survival of the Sadducees, but a group that ends up taking what we, we would call the, the stricter view. And when that gets knocked out, because we follow Beit Shammai in very few things, the view of Beit Hillel becomes the normative view that underlies the Mishnah, even when the other view is continuing to be cited, and even when, of course, there always are 
stricter views rendered than the ones that get accepted. But that's another matter because of the inner debate, which is just a debate of people who are running with the Hillel view. And, and the Shammai view is mostly finished off. So that process takes place in the inner history of, of Judaism in this period. Brilliant. Um, so I want to actually discuss the variance in the texts between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Masoretic tradition. Um, what does this tell us, let's say, about the uh, development of the biblical canon? So we have to go back, take a step before the uh, answering your direct question to explain that there were approximately 250 biblical manuscripts in the Dead Sea Scrolls. As we mentioned before, there's some pieces of everything in the Bible in the in the Tanakh, except for Esther, and except for uh, Nehemiah. Now, when we look, and this is especially the case with the Torah, when we look at these manuscripts, we see that the manuscripts come in different types. And there is one type which occupies quite a number of manuscripts, probably something like 30%, which are very, very much almost exactly like ours. There is a, for example, a manuscript of Vayikra, which is written in the old script, which is almost letter for letter R Vayikra, a few Vavs and Yud spelling issues and stuff like that. It's basically the same text. There is what we call Isaiah B from the original seven found by the Bedouin boy with his famous goat in cave one of Qumran. Now, not Isaiah A, which is in the middle of the shrine of the book of the Israel Museum, the Heikala Sefer, but Isaiah B. Isaiah B is a proto-Masoretic text, almost the same as ours. So many, many ones are like that. Then there are a couple of other types of texts. There are a small number of texts that look, they have variations that look like variations of the Greek Bible. They prove that the variations of the Greek Bible come from a using a biblical text that was a little different from ours or that some of those variations come from that. We call those Septuagintal texts because the Septuagint is the name of the Greek Bible derived from the idea that 70 scholars wrote the translation. Now, then we have a few texts that we call Proto-Samaritan uh, because like the later Samaritan Torah, they have what we call harmonistic variants. That's where when you're, let's say, relating something in Shmot, but there are psukim about it in Devarim, you schlep those psukim in and copy them in here, and then the second time you schlep the shmot psukim into, into Devarim, and it's we call those harmonistic texts. Now, so far I accounted for the 30% proto-pharisaic, and maybe between the two things I just mentioned, another 30%, another 30 but there's 40% of something else. 40% are texts, about 40%, are texts that we call them mixed texts. I mean, they don't follow anyone particularly. They're loose texts when compared to the, the, uh, the Masoretic text. Now the question comes, how do these texts relate one to another? So now I'm going to tell you what I think about this. I'm not claiming everyone thinks this. If you examine the majority of these, what we call the mixed texts, or you examine the proto samaritan type text, what you find out in all these texts is that they're ultimately based on a text that's very much like the Masoretic text. So it seems that at some point, as the text was being handed down, two things were happening. One was that the proto Masoretic text, we call it proto because there's no vowels and there's no uh, truck, there's no uh, Tame and Mikra, no cancellation marks. So that's what we call it proto-Masoretic. In the proto-Masoretic text, when it was being passed down, it was going through a standardization process. And at the same time, there were other texts floating around. And it seems that there was tendency of some scribes or, or passers down of the text to expand texts or to, in some cases, write texts, and this is another matter, in a different dialect of Hebrew because Isaiah A is in a different dialect of Hebrew. And these coexisted with the authoritative type text. And to some extent, they're based on it and represent adaptations of it. 
Now, when we go from Qumran, where this situation obtains, to Masada and the Bar Kokhba caves, where we have texts of the Bible, less manuscripts, but we have texts of the Bible, guess what? They're all proto-Masoretic. So what is apparent is that between the period in which the Dead Sea Scrolls materials were gathered, admittedly by a group of sectarian Jews, where they at least were tolerating a variety of versions besides what we would consider to be the authoritative Masoretic text, besides that, right, they had these other ones, but the minute we get to the period a little later, Masada, remember, Qumran is destroyed in the year 68 CE, but the texts are gathered earlier. Masada is destroyed in 73 CE, both, of course, destroyed by the Romans. Now, when we get to the Barcopa Caves, 132 to 5, again, Masada and the Barcopa Caves, only proto-Masoretic text. And this indeed is the period in which it seems that the leaders of the Tanaim, teachers of the Mishnah, perhaps on the, uh, in cooperation with Kohanim and the Beit HaMikdash, manage to standardize that the proto-Masoretic is the authoritative correct text. Now, one other point I want to make. I mentioned the Beit HaMikdash because there are some texts in the Gemara that hint at the fact that there were official correctors of Bible texts in the Beit HaMikdash, Magiei Sfarim, as they're called, and that they made sure that the Bible text gradually got standardized to the authoritative proto-Masoretic. Once we hit the period of Bar Kokhba, 132 to 5, now we're still before the editing of the Mishnah, there's only one kind of text, and it is the authoritative one. And that is uh, what seems to have happened. Now, the argument I'm making, though, is that the Proto-Masoretic is the earliest form of the text. And let me explain that argument for a second. If you take a look at the Hebrew of the Masoretic text, and even if you do us do it, forget a Qumran manuscript, you could open up your regular Tanakh and do it. And you compare that to ancient inscriptions that we have from the First Temple period, you will find out that the First Temple Hebrew in the Tanakh is the first temple Hebrew of the inscriptions with just a bit more standardization of, of spelling. And when we look at the highly expansive use of Vav and Yud in some of these other types of Bible manuscripts, we excess, excess vowel letters, we can see that what's happened is that those are expanded texts and that the proto masoretic represents the earlier form of first temple Hebrew, of course, there are some books written in Second Temple Hebrew, and they tend to be moving away from the, the nature of the of the way in which the, the style is when compared to First Temple style. But uh, the, they're also proto-Masoretic. But what about like um, texts, for example, in Nehemia, there's you know kind of a switching off between Hebrew and Aramaic. Yes. So what do they make? What do you make of that? Well, that's because the, almost everything in Aramaic in the biblical books, uh, Ezra de Chemia, is documents. They copy documents. And Aramaic was the language on which all mm -hmm. those documents were written. So that's what's mostly going on there. Of course, Aramaic replaces Hebrew as the main language of the Jews in the Persian period. That is to say, after the uh, conquest of Babylonia by Cyrus the Great, 540 BCE, right? It used to be, if you talked about this in Great Neck, everybody knew it from high school. But now everybody went to high school in Great Neck. They don't know it anymore. But it used to be you could get an audience, and the people all knew the history of Iran from ancient times on. But okay. Now, so at any rate, right, uh, once that happens, Aramaic becomes the standard international language, and the language of most of the Jews have become the spoken language. And then, when the Maccabean revolt came, we have a big revival of Hebrew. And that revival of Hebrew is unfortunately pushed away by the time you get to the time of the Mishnah already. Everyone's talking Aramaic. You know, that the, the students of uh, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who edited the Mishnah, there was a, 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 a woman who was a housekeeper in his home who came from the south of the country, from the area of Judea as opposed to the Galilee. And the students of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi asked her what certain Hebrew words meant because they didn't know as much Hebrew she knew because she came from the South, because Aramaic and the Galilee became the language. So there's an up and down between Hebrew and Aramaic over a number of periods of time. 
I'm curious about um, the, you know, it seems to be that the Samaritan texts kind of like fill in the blanks. That's why people consider it to be later, um, some people. But um, the fact that they maintain the Paleo-Hebrew script versus... Yeah, well, there's some Paleo-Hebrew used, what the Gemara calls, Ketav Ifri, in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls too. There are, I don't know, maybe uh, 15, 20, there's a beautiful manuscript of Shemot that's, again, almost complete in Paleo-Hebrew. But uh, the Samaritans maintained it because the Samaritans try to maintain First Temple tradition. Now, we, the, the Gomorrah tells us, and it seems to be true, that the, the script we call today, Kitab Ashuri, is really Arame Aramaic script. Mm -hmm. And it was acquired by the Jews during the Persian period, and especially by those who lived in Mesopotamia, that is today's Iraq. And they brought it back to Eretz Israel with them with the period of the return. And that was the end of the old Hebrew script that no longer got used. And one of the reasons for this is that the old Hebrew script is made to chisel into stone. If you just picture, you know, if anybody saw the movie, The Ten Commandments, which right. is actually rather funny if you see it now. Is, uh... Yeah, it's humorous to watch it. But at any rate, right, if you see The Ten Commandments, you see Joshua chiseling in stone that's what he apparently did in egypt before he became uh, moses's assistant so anyhow you see the, the the image there of chiseling in stone and the hebrew letters of the old hebrew are made for that the aramaic language is made to be written with a brush or a pen on whatever writing material you're using and not on stone on skin or papyrus and that's why it it beat out the old hebrew you know, very, very quickly. Really enlightening stuff. Um, yeah. And um, one thing that I feel like people are probably very interested in is uh, the next question. Bensi, you want to get into number six? Sure. The scrolls contain apocalyptic and messianic yeah. texts that seem to reflect the beliefs and expectations of the Qumran community. How do these beliefs compare with other Jewish and early Christian messianic expectations of the time? Okay, so what we have to do to understand this question is to realize that there are two systems of messianism in the Qumran sectarian materials, and then there's another one more in the, some of the non-sectarian texts. Now, the one that's in some of the non-sectarian texts we can deal with very quickly. I call it non-messianic messianism. It talks about a period of redemption, it talks about a period of perfection of the world, of peace, etc., but there is no Messiah figure. That's a, 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 an approach which did not get accepted in, uh, in, in Judaism or Christianity, although to some extent it's maintained in modern times by some liberal Protestants and some Reformed Jews. But it, there's no continuity. It, it died in antiquity. It came back for obvious reasons because it's easy to believe in as a kind of an ideal, but it, it gets away from divine involvement. But the points of view that the Qumran sectarians hold and that other non-sectarian documents hold fall in, in, in basically, there are, there are two types you have. Shared by Qumran and everybody else under the sun, including Christianity and every group of Jews that existed with the possible exception of those Sadducees that were highly Hellenized, is the regular old Davidic Messiah. That's the common one. It's held in numerous Qumran script the texts where there's one Messiah and it's the son of David. It is the basis of the Christian attempt to tie Jesus to the Davidic house in, in, in providing a, a genealogy for him. And it is the view that ended up in rabbinic Judaism as the main point of view of Jewish messianism. Now, the other point of view is that there are two Mashiachim. One Mashiach, one Messiah of Aharon, of Aaron, a priestly Messiah, and one a Messiah of Israel. According to this scheme, the most important thing is the temple, whereas according to the David alone scheme, the most important thing is the kingdom. So if the most important thing is the temple, there's a messianic Kohen who is the main Mashiach, and that main Mashiach has along with him 
a kind of, you could call him messianic executive director. The person mm -hmm. who handles all of the non-ritual religious parts of running the society. That would be the Messiah of Israel. Now, this point of view may be on the coins of Bar Kokhba. Because the Bar Kokhba coins, many of them, have on one side Shimon Bar Kokhba, Bar Kokhba Nesi Israel, even though his real name was Bar Kosiva, as we now know, but Shimon Bar Kokhba, the son of the star, the prince of Israel, and then I see in Yechezkel, Book of Ezekiel is a king. And on the other side, you flip over Elazar HaKohen, the name of a high priest. So that is a similar to two Messiah concept. Now, so Elazar Cohen, to Christianity. Elazar HaKohen, um, to them, what you, you're saying that he was expected to be a messianic figure? I'm not saying he was accepted by anybody. What I'm saying is whoever put him on the coin okay. may have considered that Jewish messianism requires two figures. So the they're two going figures. along the lines, they're going along the lines of this specific understanding of Messiah. Yeah, the two Messiah, two Messiah idea. By the way, if you look at the introduction in the Ashkenazic Sidor, I don't remember whether as far as I'm also say this, the introduction to Birkat Amazon and the Brit Milah. There's a whole poem that begins with Odel Shimcha, Betochem Unai, Baruchim Atem Hashem. It looks like you don't say it. Okay. And if you look at that, it has a Mashiach ben David and a Kohen who is a, uh, a who, who, who is messianic in character. The Kohen who will come back in the end of days, as opposed to the Kohen who just had Kohen. It's a, it's an eschatological idea of the Kohen. So this idea of a Kohen who's an eschatological figure, it has a little bit of a place here or there in Judaism. But now we have to get to Christianity. So I mentioned before, Christianity is basically based on the idea that Jesus would be from the house of David and therefore would be entitled to be a Messiah. Of course, every Jewish kid hears, wait a minute, how could this be? If Joseph, right, was not his father, then how can you trace through Joseph? I don't have an answer to that. Okay? That's what they did. They traced through Joseph, who's not supposed to be his natural biological father. They traced through him the claim that Yeshu, Jesus, is in reality a Davidic descendant to legitimate him. Now, when we go further with this, if you actually read all of the Christian texts, you'll find that the priestly Messiah idea comes in there also. Because in the epistle to Hebrews, Jesus is both the priest and the sacrifice. And there's a whole description there of temple practice according to that view. So what turns out in Christianity is that there are sort of echoes of the two Messiah concept also in the way in which he's pictured. Now, I have to take you back to another matter pertaining to Messianism. There are two trends in Judaism regarding the Messianic era. There is one which we call utopian and the other catastrophic. Now, the utopian Messianism is the one that became almost normative in the aftermath of the period of Kabbalah in Sfat, because that's the one that takes the concept of Tikkun of improvement and turns it into the basic basis of how to achieve uh, uh, how, to, how to achieve redemption. Now that concept existed in antiquity too. It means the following: it's utopian because we build a perfect society, and the further and further we get in that process, eventually Mashiach comes to lead us in completing it. That's the utopian idea. The catastrophic idea, we could also call it, by the way, the naturalistic idea. The catastrophic idea is that the world gets so bad that God has, there's an explosion and everything is going to be destroyed. So God sends a figure to redeem us. But in the process, there's a massive war. And in that massive war, the evildoers eventually get destroyed. That's the norm in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's why you have the scroll of the war of the sons of light against the sons of darkness. And that scroll has been mentioned several times by Netanyahu in some of his speeches. And that particular type of approach, the, the catastrophe leading to the ultimate redemption, is the basically the main one 
of the sectarians in Qumran. Even mm -hmm. though it's the main one of the sectarians in Qumran, it's very obvious that some of the other texts that they preserve that are from what I call group two, texts that are just general Jewish texts, preserve the other idea that there will be a better and better time and eventually uh, redemption will come because we will deserve it. In a certain way, this is the argument of the rabbis, whether the redemption will come to a world that is completely innocent and guiltless or one that is completely guilty. Because if you're completely guilty, you better have a quick redemption before the whole world explodes. And if you're completely righteous, you get a redemption because you deserve it. So those two concepts exist in the scrolls, but the sectarians themselves adhere to the catastrophic one. Now, by the way, this is compromised in the Rambam, because the Rambam assumes that there would still be a war at the end of days because of the need to obliterate a minority of bad people in order to have the naturalistic type of event of messianic era that he expects. So I have a question about the uh, sons of darkness versus the sons of light. Yeah. Who, who did they believe? Do we know who they believed were? The oh, sons? yeah. Just read the text. They tell you it's everybody but us. <laughs> this is the problem with the Dead Sea Scrolls as an example for contemporary Judaism. There are some things they believe that are opposite. One thing they believe is absolute predestination. Absolute predestination, God makes every decision for you. Mm. Now, that is not a normal Jewish belief. Normal Jewish belief is that God foreknows what we will do. But we have choice. We make free choice. Now, the other thing, though, that they believe that is not uh, sort of like in character of Judaism is to believe that everybody but them is an evildoer and to be destroyed. So if you look at the text, it describes wars with all the nations around until they're finally victorious against all of them. And then it includes the fact that all Jews who don't join them will be destroyed. And then at the end, they're going to march up to Yerushalayim and run the temple according to their views. So this gets to sort of what you might call the dark side of the sons of light, because there are parts of their approach in as a result of their extreme sectarianism, which are not ones that Judaism wants to uh, you know put into practice in any way in any way at all. So I mean the, the, the no matter what messianic point of view you take in Judaism, the idea is that the the non-Jews who are good people, are all going to still be around at the end of the day so they can come up to the temple as it's... Right? The nice people stay with us, right? So here, the idea, everybody but us is no good. That's what you see there. That's fascinating. Yeah. It's That's a negative type of messianism, you might say. It's almost an angry messianism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you see, what's interesting is if you go through that very same text, I just have to tell you, it doesn't happen what they say. This is very funny. They make it out in the text that all the nations are going to be destroyed. Whoever wrote this text compiled it from some other documents. And one of the things that he put into this, this uh, scroll of the war of the sons against the light, sons of darkness are apparently pre-existing beautiful poems. And he has the most beautiful poem about all the nations coming up to worship God in the end of days. Well, what do you mean? You just told me they're supposed to be killed because they're all no good. And he got them coming up to worship God. What's going on? So apparently, they, either they weren't happy with that idea themselves, or they compromised. I don't know. But you, you see, the poems have the other type of vision. The more you talk about it, the more I understand what you mean by the development part of Judaism, how things yeah. things develop, you know, and it's, it's extremely necessary because yeah. as... <laughs> You see so many strange ideas and things, and that just just creep in. And well, the very interesting fact is that if you look in the in the Talmud in Sanhedrin, you see that sometime in the second or third century, you start to get there the discussion of the messianic era, and you see that a lot of these kind of apocalyptic ideas start to be mentioned by Chazal that weren't mentioned earlier, and we don't know why they're mentioned at that time, but many of them seem to be aspects of the heritage of Second Temple times. 
A famous example that we can't solve is the Mashiach ben Yosef. It looks like something that must be a second temple idea, but we don't have any text mentioning Mashiach ben Yosef. The idea that there's a predecessor Mashiach who gets killed in battle. And then again, we also know that the very same ideas in the end of the Byzantine period, before the Muslim conquest, so we're talking now really about the 500s and early 600s, quite a number of texts were composed, some of which continue to be composed after the Muslim conquest, which talk about catastrophic war and which assume a great war in which somebody is going to defeat the Romans. Now, the Romans were the main enemy that the war scroll thought it would have to fight because apparently the scroll was written sometime either around or before the Romans came to Eretz Israel in 63 BCE. They conquered it. We can't mix that up with the destruction. Destruction is in CE, right? 70 CE, the temple was destroyed. 63 BCE, the Romans first conquered Eretz Israel. So at any rate, the uh, it seems the Dead Sea sectarians in the war scroll expected the Romans to be the main protagonists, the enemy. And uh, they have a term for them, Kitim, because the Kition is, on, is, is, is an island on Crete. So a part of Crete, a city in Crete, I'm sorry, city in Crete. And they assumed that the Romans would be coming from the Aegean somehow. But uh, at any rate, what is really interesting uh, to see is that the very same ideas of major battles involving Roman armies, Roman now being Byzantium, against somebody, in this case being the Arabs, was understood to perhaps be a harbinger of the end of days. And so texts that look like the war scroll were being written in that era, in the, the 500s and early 600s of uh, CE. Wow, eye-opening stuff. And um, I actually wanted to mention that, um, and you, you've discussed this on, on other uh, podcasts that I've heard you on, is that besides, obviously, what we learned about messianism at the time and, and even Christianity, one thing that that people don't know, or at least Jewish people don't know usually, is that, um, you know, by studying certain Christian texts, we discover a lot of practices of, of Jews at the time. Like, for example, the first time a maftir is, is mentioned, is it right? Is, correct me if I'm wrong. Jesus yeah. is a maftir. Yeah, it's mentioned. In, it doesn't mean it's the first maftir. It right. just means the first mention. Or another mm -hmm. example they always give, which is a funny example, is you ask the question, who is the first Jew that we know was named that is Brit Milah. It doesn't mean he's the first one to be named that is Brit Milah, but John, it's John, John, John the Baptist. And and the reality is that to to the New Testament in general is a very important source for certain things about the history of Judaism. And just as to give one example beyond the kind of things we're talking about right now, when you get to the book of Acts and they describe the apostles going all over the area of Turkey, and Greece, and eventually reaching Rome, and some of the isles. This is some of the earliest evidence we have for the Jewish communities, because they always go to the synagogues. And it's the earliest information we have of synagogues in those places. And then uh, there's a lot, a, lot, a lot of other things that are not understood about the manner in which these texts provide information about Jewish history. And uh, as I say, some, some religious practices, but some other things as well. So before we go, um, I just want to know um, what you think. Do you think that these texts today are relevant to the modern uh, reader? The modern. Well, I'll tell you, there's some very interesting ways in which they're relevant. First of all, I mean, you can compare ideas like uh, messianic ideas with well, what do we should we believe today as Jews? But remember one important thing: the Dead Sea Scrolls don't have religious authority. For us, they're historical texts. They don't have religious authority anyone because they're not part of the direct line of tradition of Jewish texts. Now, this is not the only type of text that has this problem, but it's stronger than, you know, the, the Khatam Sofer, excuse me, the Chazon, the Chazon, Ish, Chazon Ish, did not want people to use tractates of the Me'iri that weren't known in earlier times on the grounds that they're not a direct part of the tradition. But it's fairly obvious that the Me'iri fits right into 
the tradition of the rabbis of the Middle Ages. It's obvious that these texts do not fit into the straight misora of the Prushim and the rabbis of the Talmud. So that being the case, these are really for us historical texts. So the relevance is A, we can learn a tremendous amount about our complex history. And some of the things that we learn about our complex history will be relevant today because we need to consider some of the same same issues sometimes. And I don't mean, you know, we're not going to reconsider our calendar. What I mean to say by that is that we can take lessons from these texts about what happens when certain extreme positions are allowed to overcome other positions. We can see in these texts, there are some texts that have very beautiful ideas, poetry that's inspiring, and things like this that we can gain by studying these texts, but they don't have a place in the authoritative authority system. Now, there's one other really interesting fact about these texts. And actually, I gave for the second time a lecture about this only uh, yesterday. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't yesterday. It was the day before. Sorry. And uh, it was uh, the, the role that they've played in Jewish-Christian relations. And this is because these scrolls have reminded many Christians about the extent to which Christianity is rooted in early Judaism. And that notion has been a help in the history of Jewish-Christian relations and the improvement that started after the Holocaust, partly because of the Holocaust. But the scrolls are quoted every once in a while in works that are arguing for Christians to give up anti-Semitism and to take more positive views of Jews and Jew of, of Jews and Judaism. And uh, this has happened. There is some uh, particular places that's quite prominent, for example, in a work that the Catholic Church issued regarding Jewish interpretation of the Bible and how it should be respected. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are mentioned explicitly there. So what's happened is that the scrolls have had certain positive effects on the Christian move away from anti-Semitism among those who have made that move. And that's a, been a, a very positive thing. Do they, do they feel the same way about, let's say, the um, Book of Enoch and books in the Apocrypha? Um, is, that, is that something of the Well, this is very... Now you're opening up a big question. Here's why. Because those books are actually, first of all, there is Enoch in the scrolls. Okay. okay. Second of all, 12 books that are the Apocrypha are in the Catholic Bible. This is a humorous fact. Every Catholic has the books of Maccabees telling the Hanukkah story in their Bible. Yes. So imagine if we had the Christmas story in our Bible, right? They have it in the Bible. Now, the question, when we talk about these changes in Christianity, moving away from positions that were anti-Semitic, which has certainly been done officially by the Catholic Church, it's certainly obviously been done unofficially in the evangelical groups that love Israel and love Jews. And it's been done in certain ways, even by the liberal Protestants that are not our greatest fans. But of course, the Catholic Church did it officially in the 60s. Now, the point I want to make is that this was part of a trend that starts already much earlier to see the history of Judaism, and therefore the background of Christianity, as available in documents like Apocrypha and some of these other documents, then that was starting before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Then came the Holocaust, which is a very big reason to do this, because many Christians realized that the, the Holocaust did have a background in Christian anti-Semitism, even if it wasn't the direct cause. cause and then the scrolls came and waved a gigantic flag about the significance of placing Christianity's origins in the context of inner Jewish debate and Jewish discussion. And then one of the big conclusions of that was that classical Christian anti-Semitism was not a very good idea. And it began to be rejected by church after church in official documents. And the scrolls have a role there. I don't want to overestimate that role, but they have a role in making that happen. Although, sadly, the Holocaust is probably the, the biggest factor here, in, in certainly for the Vatican, in, in wanting to make sure that they could not harbor concepts 
that could lead to violence of that and, and destruction of that nature and 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 you know physical annihilation of Jews. So they they moved squarely away from it. But the scrolls are there in that story, in a uh, I don't know what we want to say, what we ought to call it, not the leading role, but a role. But the whole rediscovery of Second Temple Judaism starts in the Renaissance, runs through the Reformation for the non-Jews. Jews it starts in the Renaissance. For them, it starts in the Reformation, and it the scrolls and what's going on today and archaeology and all this have completely, you know, uh, brought this to the surface. So is that why the, um, I forget which pope it was in the previous century, um, tried to kind of backtrack and say that we made a mistake when, when it came to scapegoating the Jews and Judas as the Yeah, well, this is from the 60s when this started, Pope John Paul XXIII, followed by he passed away in the middle and the job was finished by uh, Pope Paul the, the, the Sixth, and uh, these positions, you know, have been taken very formally by the Catholic Church, and other churches followed in many ways, either formally or informally. Now, I mean, we still have problems with certain groups. Much of those problems are about Israel, and, and those problems remain. But the classical anti-Semitism has, for the most part, been removed. Yeah. I mean, I think, to me, the biggest, um, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like the biggest source of anti-Semitism is the you know, deicide, right? The, uh, the yeah, but no one believes that anymore. Right. Well, That's but, the point. Because the New Testament actually doesn't say it. The crazy oh. part. The New Testament says that the Romans killed them. Exactly. Exactly. That's a strange, the whole thing was strange. Yeah. Amazing. Well, we really want to thank you. This was so okay. eye-opening. And uh, thank you for making the time. It was really amazing. okay. So we'll say good night and thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Let, let, me, know, let me know when it's posted, etc. Of course, of course. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. Good night. Very much. I appreciate your time. Thank sure. you. Sure. Okay. Good night. Good night.